Hi, I'm Professor David Attlee, and this is Topics in Astronomy. Thank you for joining me. In this, the final video in this series, I'll talk to you about the Cosmic Distance Ladder. It's an important part in the astronomer's toolbox, and it's an essential element in our ability to study the universe on the largest possible scales. Let's get started. The Cosmic Distance Ladder is basically a tool that we use to bootstrap our way from the things nearby that we can measure relatively easily, like the structure and size of the solar system, and working through a group of increasingly distant calibration indicators until we eventually get to a point that lets us measure distances across the universe as a whole. Each rung on the ladder builds on all of the rungs below it. If one of those rungs breaks, all of the conclusions that we drew using the ladder then comes into question. So we might have to fix whatever rung broke and then revisit what we knew based on the rungs above it. This has been an important problem, for example, in our use of Cepheids in order to attempt to measure Hubble's law and getting a successful calibration of the Cepheid distance indicator was one of the major projects that the Hubble Space Telescope was designed to undertake. Let's work through some of the key rungs on this distance ladder and talk a little bit about how they work. The bottom rung on the ladder is based in the solar system on our ability to measure distances within our own solar system, and in particular, to work out the size of the Earth's orbit. These days, that's typically done using radar. By bouncing a radar signal off the planet Venus, we can measure the distance between the Earth and Venus and work out the overall scale of the solar system. That is, calibrate astronomical units that we use to measure the size of planetary orbits with say, the standard meter that's kept in Paris. Once we have that, we can then use stellar parallaxes to measure distances to relatively nearby stars, or these days, actually not that nearby anymore at all. Uh, the Gaia spacecraft is measuring about 1% of all the stars in the Milky Way using stellar parallax, and in order to do that, it has to work at quite significant distance. But anyway, what's parallax and why is it important? You should have already learned about parallax when you were studying the heliocentric revolution and its connection to geocentrism. But just as a reminder, parallax is the apparent shift in the position of a nearby star compared to a distant star caused by the motion of the Earth around the Sun. So the change in the direction of observation caused by the motion of the Earth, causes nearby stars to shift a lot, and more distant stars to shift only a little. And that relative shift is what we call parallax. This gives us an estimate for the distances to nearby stars, and it also gives us one of the really important distance measurements used by professional astronomers. I've mostly been, in, been ignoring the parsec, uh, but it is something that you might occasionally come across. Uh, a parsec is just a measurement of distance. It's approximately equal to 3.26 light years, and the nearest star has a distance of about one parsec from the Earth. Um, so that's a typical distance between stars in the Earth's neighborhood of the Milky Way. Once we have the ability to measure distances to nearby stars, we can calculate the luminosities of those stars given their observed brightnesses. We could start to fill in the HR diagram, and that lets us develop our next step on this distance ladder, and that is using what's called spectroscopic parallax, technically, but that's a really confusing name because there's no parallax involved at all. So instead, I'm labeling that spectroscopic distances for the purposes of this discussion. This is based on a knowledge of the main sequence. 
If we know that a star belongs to the main sequence and we can measure its temperature, that then tells us the luminosity of that star because there's a tight relationship between temperature and luminosity for main sequence stars. This, in turn, gives us a tool that we can use to calculate the distance of that star. So we know luminosity, we can measure brightness, and then using an equation that connects luminosity, distance, and brightness, we can calculate distance. I've showed you this equation previously in this series, but here it is again. Luminosity equals 4 pi times distance squared times brightness. So if we can measure brightness, figure out luminosity independently, we then have two of the, the three variables and we can calculate distance. This is how most of the rungs on the distance ladder are going to work. We're going to figure out some category of objects whose luminosities we know or can figure out easily, measure the brightness of those objects, and then combining luminosity and brightness, calculate distance. That's how the next rung on the ladder works as well. The next rung relies on a category of objects called Cepheid variables. As the name implies, Cepheids are variable. They change their brightness over time in a predictable way. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side of the slide two images taken at two different times, and you'll notice highlighted by the yellow circle a star that is alternately bright and faint, and then bright and then faint. And that is an example of a Cepheid variable. Cepheids vary in their brightness over time in a really predictable, regular way. They demonstrate this kind of sawtooth pattern in what's called their light curve, so their brightness is a function of time. And you see that the Cepheid is bright, and then it gradually gets fainter, and then rapidly brightens again, and then gradually gets fainter in this regular pattern. This is relatively easily recognizable, so we can identify these Cepheid variables and then also measure the time that it takes to cycle from bright to faint and then back to bright again. And this is important because Cepheids demonstrate a relationship that we call a period luminosity relation. Cepheids are extremely luminous stars late in their life cycle, so they're very, very massive stars that have left the main sequence, they've turned into supergiants and they're moving through a part of the HR diagram that's called the instability strip. So stars in that instability strip, unsurprisingly, are unstable. So they don't have a steady luminosity, they tend to fluctuate over time. Cepheids are in that instability strip, and when they're there, they pulsate. So they start from a small size, they expand and become more luminous, and then they contract and become less luminous again. And they do that in a regular way that we can measure. The Cepheid period luminosity relationship that I referred to earlier was first discovered by the astronomer Henrietta Swan Leavitt. She's one of the most famous and most important astronomers of the 20th century. She was interested primarily in Cepheids in their own right. So as curiosities, trying to figure out why these stars act in this frankly kind of bizarre way. And as she was working on this problem, she noted this period luminosity relation, which then became useful for other astronomers trying to solve other problems. Um, one famous astronomer who relied on the Cepheid period luminosity relation was Edwin Hubble. And he used that to resolve a debate among astronomers called the Great Debate, and also to develop Hubble's law, which you'll learn about separately. So this is a graphic representing the distance ladder as I've talked about it today. We start in the solar system by measuring the size of the Earth's orbit. That's relatively easy, we just use radar. And that then allows us to calibrate the first step up the distance ladder. So we step from the ground of the solar system onto that first rung that relies on stellar parallax. 
Stellar parallax then allows us to develop an understanding of the relationship between temperature and luminosity for main sequence stars, build up that spectroscopic distance indicator, which allows us to work out towards greater distances, find rare stars like the high mass stars late in their life cycle that create Cepheid variables, and on and on we go. Other than parallax, the stages on the ladder, and there's one more that'll come up when we start talking about dark energy in class, but the stages on the ladder rely on the relationship between brightness, luminosity, and distance, and by measuring any two of those, we can always solve for the third one. So this cosmic distance ladder is a tremendous tool for answering all sorts of important questions in extragalactic astronomy, from the nature of of spiral nebulae, which was a problem that Edwin Hubble solved around 100 years ago, to the structure and evolution of the universe on the largest possible scales. One key element in that cosmic distance ladder, which was extremely important historically and continues to be an important question that astronomers wrestle with today, is the use of Cepheids and the observed period luminosity relationship to calculate distances to relatively nearby galaxies. Thank you for watching. Thank you for joining me for this entire series of mini lectures connected to important topics in astronomy. I hope you feel that you've learned something. Hopefully I've triggered an interest, so you might wanna go and look at some other videos out there. There's lots of great astronomy resources on YouTube. I'll flag a couple in the end cards at the end of this video. And thanks once more for watching.